Hello everybody, this is Mike History 2, and today I'll be talking about the history of Vanuatu. So the history of Vanuatu begins in 1606, when the Portuguese explorer Pedro Fernando de Quiros, working for Spain, arrived on the largest island, believing he had reached Australia, and named it La Australia del Espíritu Santo, meaning the southern land of the Holy Spirit, now known simply as Espíritu Santo. He established a settlement at Big Bay on the northern shore there, but it soon failed. The Europeans didn't return until 1768, when Louis-Antoine de Bougainville, a French explorer, arrived naming the islands the Great Cyclades. In 1774, the British explorer James Cook arrived, naming the islands the New Hebrides. In 1825, the British trader Peter Dillon discovered Sano Wood at Aromango. This started a rush that ended in 1830 after a clash between immigrant Polynesian workers and the native Melanesians. During the 1860s, planters in the United Kingdom, Fiji and France, in need of labor, started a long-term indentured labor trade known as blackbirding. At the height of the blackbirding, more than one half of the adult male population of several of the islands worked abroad. It was at this time that Catholic and Protestant missionaries arrived on the islands. For example, John Getty, a British Protestant missionary from Canada, yay, that's my country, arrived at Natium in 1848, where he spent the rest of his life there, working to convert the inhabitants to Christianity in Western ways. Settlers also came, looking for land on which to establish cotton plantations. When international cotton prices collapsed, they switched to coffee, cocoa, bananas, and most successfully, coconuts. Initially, British settlers made up the majority, but the establishment of the Caledonian Company of the New Hebrides in 1882 soon tipped the balance in favor of French settlers. By around the start of the 20th century, the French outnumbered the British 2 to 1. Franceville, now called Port Villa on Ifate, was established during this period. In 1878, the United Kingdom and France declared all of the New Hebrides to be neutral territory. The lack of government led to rising discontent among British and French settlers. In 1887, both countries created an Anglo-French Joint Naval Commission to defend their citizens. However, this ended on August 8, 1918. August 9, 1889, when Franceville declared itself independent under the leadership of President Ferdinand Chivillard, became the first country to practice universal suffrage without distinction of sex or race. Although the district's population at the time consisted of about 500 natives and fewer than 50 Europeans, only the Europeans were allowed to hold office. However, Franceville only lasted one year. In 1890, it was replaced by the Anglo-French Joint Naval Commission. Since both the British and French settlers wanted to join their respective nations, in 1906 the United Kingdom and France decided to make the New Hebrides part of both of their countries, um, ending the Anglo-French Joint Naval Commission for good. Although it seems strange now, it wasn't too uncommon for regions to be part of two countries at the same time. A similar thing happened in Canada when southwestern Canada was part of the United States and the United Kingdom at the same time. The natives were not given British or French citizenship, though, and if they traveled, they needed an identity document signed by both the British and French resident commissioners. However, as you can probably imagine, being part of two countries would be extremely complicated. There were two laws, two police forces, two prisons, two currencies, and two education and health systems. Starting in 1921, French plantation owners let Annamese workers come. That's Vietnam. Challenges to this form of government began in the early 1940s. The arrival of Americans during World War II with their informal habits and relative wealth contributed to the rise of nationalism in the islands. The belief in a mythical messianic figure named John Frum was the basis for an indigenous cargo cult, a movement attempting to obtain industrial goods through magic, promising Melanesian deliverance. Today, John Frum is both a religion and a political party. Perhaps the final political impetus towards independence was the central issue of land ownership, which arose during the 1960s. European-held land had been mostly cleared for coconut production. But when they began clearing more land for coconut productions, protests began in both Espiritu Santo and Malukula, led by Jimmy Stevens. In the 1960s, France opposed the United Kingdom's desire to give independence to the New Hebrides, fearing that the independence sentiment would be contagious in their mili in their mineral-rich French New Caledonia, which, by the way, is actually still a part of France. The first political party was established in the early 1970s and originally was called the New Hebrides National Party. One of the founders was Walter Linney, an Anglican priest who later became prime minister. Renamed the Vanua Aku Party in 1974, the party pushed for independence. In 1979, foreign owners were dispossessed 
and they received compensation from their governments and a date was set for full independence. France was pretty unhappy. Significant rebellions occurred on Tana and Espiritu Santo and paperwork revealed that France wanted to make Espiritu Santo a separate French possession. Beginning in June 1980, Jimmy Stevens led an uprising called the Coconut War against the United Kingdom and France and their plans for independence. The uprising lasted for about 12 weeks. The rebels blockaded Santo Pecoa International Airport, destroyed two bridges, and declared the independence of Espiritu Santo as a new country of Imerana. Stevens was supported by French landowners and by the Phoenix Foundation, an American business foundation that supported the establishment of a libertarian tax haven in the New Hebrides. France refused to allow the United Kingdom to deploy troops to defuse the crisis, and French soldiers on Espiritu Santo took no action. As Independence Day neared the Prime Minister-elect, Walter Linney asked if Papua New Guinea would send troops to intervene. The residents of Espiritu Santo generally welcomed the Papua New Guineans as fellow Melanesians. Stephen's followers were armed only with bows and arrows, rocks and slings. There were few casualties and the war came to a sudden end when a vehicle carrying Stephen's son burst through a Papua New Guinean roadblock in late August 1980. The soldiers opened fire on the vehicles, killing Stephen's son. Shortly thereafter, Jimmy Stephen surrendered. At Stephen's trial, the support of the Phoenix Foundation to the rebellion was revealed. It was also revealed that the French government had secretly supported Stephen's and his efforts. Stevens was sentenced to 14 years of imprisonment and remained in prison until 1991. On July 30th, Vanuatu finally became independent. During the 1990s, Vanuatu experienced a period of political instability which resulted in a more decentralized government. The Vanuatu Mobile Force, a paramilitary group, attempted a coup in 1996 because of a pay dispute. There were also allegations of corruption in the government of Maxime Carlo Corman. Anyways, that's it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.